Hey, everybody. Welcome to J.D. Power's Technology Support Podcast. I'm Michael Vermillion with J.D. Power, and with me today are Mark Miller, Greg Dickerson, and Mike Noeth. Uh, Mark, Greg, Mike, welcome. Thanks, Mike. Glad to be here. Thank you. Uh, so in today's podcast, we're going to continue the conversation uh, around the framework that J.D. Power has developed uh, around a uh, maturity model for technical support organizations. And we've built the model around four pillars, strategy, people, process, and technology. Uh, we're covering each of these pillars in, in separate podcasts. Uh, today, we're going to focus on the people pillar. Uh, and uh, the first element uh, around people uh, in terms of evaluating where companies are in maturity is around capability for recruiting and hiring. So Greg, how do we how do we think about recruiting and hiring? What do we see in terms of best practices from top performing companies and, and how does that compare to where many companies are today? What we typically see companies are in the you know foundational or stable phase of the maturity model. They haven't quite reached the best practice phase. Um, those that have a you know, a stable process in place on this very critical element, obviously, uh, this is the groundwork for what you're going to see in the future. Um, those that have that stable environment have things like standard interview questions, and they have frequent calibration sessions between the recruiters and the hiring managers to make sure that they, you know, what is being sought is what the manager is truly looking for. Um, you know, the organizations that ensure that their recruiters and hiring managers meet regularly to have those discussions and to, um, you know, like I said, stay on the same page in terms of the candidates that are uh, in that pipeline and are being considered. You know, recruiters that adapt the hiring profile to match the, the nuances of, of top performers. These are all you know, uh, fairly stable actions. Um, you know, one of the best practices that I've seen is a, uh, where I saw where it was truly a robust candidate database and a workflow where every interaction with the candidate from the recruiter through the hiring manager, um, anything to do with the interview process and the consideration is all kept in a singular database that everyone can look at and truly understand what it is that is, you know, this candidate brings to the table uh, and being able to, you know, have every step of the process clearly tracked in the ATS is not something you see commonly, but it is the, the kind of the leading edge, the best practices that are out there. Um, and, these days, it's just as important to adapt the qualifications that you're looking for when you're in uh, a hybrid or a remote uh, working environment, because those conditions are different no matter how we try and spin it, that it's just a, you know, it's just a different physical location. The fact of the matter is you want to look for better writing skills and you want to look for indications in behavioral interviews that are going to address whether or not that individual candidate is capable of working in a um, in a remote environment. Yeah, and it's it's super important to ensure that the the hiring managers and the, and the recruiters are on the same page here and and uh, and, and do meet regularly um, because we're looking for a fit. You know, support as I've said many times is a team sport. And, and you can teach the product, you can teach the, the diagnostic tools. It's, it's harder to teach someone what being a support person is all about because support people inherently want to help. And, they're, and they're, their posture is to, to help and to solve problems and to work collaboratively. And, and those are equally important, if not more so, than the technical aspects when doing the interviews to make sure that you do have the good fit, which of course manifests itself in lower attrition and lower fallout, say, in the first 90 days of the job. Okay, um, so moving on from recruiting and hiring then, the, kind of the next stage um, or next element that we look at for people uh, is around um, 
training. So, so for training, uh, where are most companies today and, and, and where should they be aspiring to in terms of, um, of best practices? Well, every company out there is, you know, has a pretty set format of onboarding, uh, you know, orientation to the, to the organization, uh, doing the product training, process training, uh, some level of soft skills training. Um, but really what we see is that more mature organizations, they have, amongst other things, clearly documented development plans and goals that outline it not just for the initial training, but looking forward and making sure that it's a continual process. And that's really what training is, is a continual process. And what we alluded to previously, when we were talking about recruiting the fact that, you know, finding that right fit, um, because some of the best practices that are out there involve not the uh, atypical tier one, tier two, tier three escalation path. Uh, I'm going to hand you off to someone else because it's out of my scope. It's more of a, you know, collaborative swarming style where if I get a case, I keep that case and I simply, you know, utilize the resources that are available in the organization and I know where those resources are. And so developing that whole aspect is, is absolutely critical to making sure that the, the individual knows what those resources are and knows how to get to those resources and get the answers. And so developing all of that within the training process is, is important. And it's also important, as with anything else, with running a technical support organization, it has to be done with consideration of VOC. Otherwise, you're just doing things your way and you hope that your customers fit in somewhere along the line. Um, companies that track all of their training, whether it's some uh, a refresher course or whether it's uh, you know planned mandatory training that uh, all organizations have that takes place throughout the year, making sure all of that is gathered and making sure that they have a clear vision of uh, what the organization is capable of and. Uh, who has what skills and, and and really identifying perhaps through a matrix that they understand where their gaps are and know how to fill those gaps. That's uh, what's really, really important. So, And, and training is really an ongoing type of thing. I mean, we often think about it as uh, in a technical support environment as the, the new product training, how quickly can we get the reps uh, ready to uh, be starting to take live cases, and that's part of it. Uh, however, it really needs to adapt over time. The, the needs are going to change. The, the technology is going to change. We might implement new channels and the requirements there change. And it's not just for our first level people, because you know managers are people too, and they need training to become a proficient level one manager, to advance to a director level, to advance to an executive level. All of those things are super important. So we need to look at things like product training, soft skills, cultural training, and managing remotely and, and all these kinds of things that maybe uh, some of which were not in the curriculum, say, just a few years ago. Yeah, so, so another element of people is uh, employee engagement. And, and we all know that having engaged employees is important, but, but, but how, do you, how do you do it in a way that's sustainable over time and then especially in this environment of work at home or or hybrid work environments uh, what do we see in terms of best practices there yeah a lot of companies uh, at the foundation level they'll have an annual employee satisfaction survey and and uh, it'll ask employees what they think on a variety of, uh, of of topics and uh some of those companies have moved to maybe more of a quarterly pulse survey Although they've got to be a little careful about survey fatigue, and, and I, I just want to spend a second on on a little bit more on survey fatigue. It's not so much the frequency of the survey, but if you didn't do anything about last time you asked me a question, then that's when I get fatigued versus, you know, I don't mind having a regular conversation if I see action. And I think that's one of the keys that, that the, the better companies are 
uh, not only uh, conducting these surveys, but they're saying, here's what we heard. And they may not agree with everything. That's fine. But here's what we heard. And here's what we're going to do about it. And, and even more to the point, we're going to do something about that together. It's not us, the management team, doing something to you, the, the rank and file. We're going to figure out what to do together based on what the survey said. And, and um, I just can't stress enough that, that uh, companies really fail their employees when they ask for input and then just go silent or they get they get to it months and months later indicating that it, it, you know it's just not it's just not It's important. funny that you mentioned that because I can probably one of the worst examples I can provide is uh and this happened to be with an outsourced partner for a uh, organization but they indicated in our conversation that they conducted annual employee surveys every December. And when I asked them about the results and the actions that came out of that, the most recent survey, the previous survey, they said, oh, we don't have the results yet. Uh, and it was June. And that is uh, unconscionable, right? Um, well, at that point, you're, you're better off literally not doing them. Um, I know we've had to counsel people over the years around that recency effect, uh, Mike and Greg, what you all just mentioned there, that uh, Mike, you're 100 percent right on, right? That that fatigue comes from no action. Um, and, you know, we've been talking about surveys. I, I think one of the things that best practice companies do that enhance engagement is being not only proactive, but specifically proactive around solving problems, you know, engaging folks who are closest with the, with the customer. Do you guys see that in, in top performers, how they've kind of formalized that process? Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, 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 what do you, what do you think we should do about it? And you being a frontline person who's got probably a far better answer than I, the first or second or third level manager who doesn't talk to customers nearly as frequently. So, uh, you know, if if the if the employees voiced uh, some frustration with respect to uh, I'm making this up, um, it's very difficult for me to find the information I need to do my job. Well, what do you think we should do about that? Well, let's clear all the junk out of the database. Let's have a little bit more, a better search capability because you know not only do we want customers to search for their own issues, we the employees need to search for information too. So that's just a quick example of engaging the the person who's most affected by the current status and who would most benefit by an improvement. Yeah, and Mike, you take that to the next level because um, what we see is that companies that move fast are actually taking a bit more time and engaging that front line in the first couple of uh, levels uh, because executional speed is enhanced because, hey, these folks, i.e. management, are taking our guidance and yeah it's like in the example you just gave there mike i'm willing to spend some time of identifying those uh pieces in the database that do need to be cleaned out because that's a necessary action the example that you gave well if that comes from on high and you're being done to versus being done with that really affects executional excellence and uh, bogs things down and can create uh, discontinuity where that is a uh, flaw of the management team's approach of just not engaging them. So um, it's definitely true across all service organizations, but that's a great example that you gave in the technical support and the knowledge base, which is so critical. And the other, the other side of that spectrum is um, an organization that actually had a well-defined process, well-defined mechanism to capture knowledge management feedback from the customer and from their front lines. And then what they would do with that is they would actually, uh, on a monthly or bi-monthly basis, they would have... Uh, a brown bag session uh, with their front lines and bring those issues forward and um, solicit additional feedback from everyone participating in the in the brown bag session. It helped them to find solutions to customer uh, desires, issues, complaints, 
uh, and uh, from the perspective of the front lines as well. So, so to wrap up today's um, topic around people, the final element in the framework is around coaching and development. Uh, so th those are both pretty robust uh, areas uh, to explore. Uh, but Mike, maybe we can focus on the importance of having a formal program in place. Yeah, the, the, uh, in order to have some uh, just some good general coaching and performance management, uh, I just want to back it up and say that uh, hopefully the person serving as the coach, or let's just say the first level manager in this particular example, has received some development themselves. Uh, oftentimes we see where somebody becomes a manager because they were the most senior people or person on the team. And, you know, it's different work and we all know that. However, there needs to be a development plan to make that person ready to become a manager. Uh, on the assumption that they are taking that forward, then, yeah, we like to see a best practice whereby there's one-on-ones regularly scheduled between a manager and, and each individual contributor. And they can be weekly, they could be bi-weekly, they could even be monthly, although that's a little bit of a stretch, especially in a remote working environment. But the, the real key, not so much frequency, is what's the content? And it shouldn't be limited to just, let's talk about your open cases, let's talk about uh, your performance, which is obviously uh, crucial, but let's also talk about your development. Where do you want to go next? What support can I give you? What type of training might you need? What type of mentoring could you use? Maybe there's some job shadowing. And, and all too often we see that those one-on-ones are primarily focused or even solely focused on performance and not sufficiently focused on development. So we just want to like, we want to see both. And, uh, and, and while employees own their own career, the, the manager does play a role in terms of supporting that, that employee's aspirations. Now, specifically around uh, coaching pertaining to, say, quality monitoring and, and, and reviewing cases, we, we like to see a best practice whereby a random sample of support cases are reviewed, uh, they're listened to, the recordings are listened to, the case transcripts are read, uh, the chat transcripts are read, the uh, steps that the uh, engineer uh, took were reviewed, and, and, and best practice is that several of us will review a case independently or a number of cases, each independently. Then we come together and we have a conversation around, are we on the same page or not? Uh, providing this feedback to our engineers is, is, a, is a service that we owe them. And, uh, and, and we owe them, more importantly, to be consistent in terms of providing that feedback. Some of the um, best coaching and development sessions that I have seen like to operate on a separate cadence. They want to make sure that they are focusing in on, you know, giving feedback and, and helping uh, their employee uh, learn from past uh, in customer engagements, but then separating out the uh, development portion so that it's focused entirely on development. I mean, you know, if you stop and think about it, what employee wants to talk about additional training or career opportunities when they were just told about the three things they did wrong on the case that was reviewed? So s separating that out, creating a separate cadence, um, what I've discovered anyway is organizations that are doing that are finding it to be significantly more effective. Hey, I just wanted to add, though that's great feedback uh, from both of you in terms of coaching those listening to the calls. The last thing I would say to kind of put a bow on this is when you think about the best organizations, they are constantly um, coaching and developing based on uh, the top priorities identified within the organization. So this all links back to this notion of what we call CX immersion, where you're measuring the KPIs, absolutely. You're also talking to the customers, uh, absolutely. So you're identifying gaps through that process. And then you're very intentional about moving and addressing those gaps and moving behavioral change at the rep level, primarily through three areas, uh, QA, training, and coaching and development. And it's all supported by robust communication, ideally from the top. But it's just this concept here of tying in that coaching 
uh, to what the organization is trying to address in terms of its biggest gaps really helps move the organization's CX and performance up more radically um, than many other things that you can do. So the, the coaching and development part, totally agree that those things should be separate. But um, if you uh, have that ability to tie in those gaps and attack those gaps through coaching, um, it's very powerful in moving an organization forward. I would just add to that, Mark, that on, on another podcast, uh, we had spoken about research and research application, really the survey process and the findings. And to your point, when we're coaching our employees, we need to ensure that what we're, what we're reviewing on our scorecard, the important things that we're stressing, are directly in line with what customers care about. Uh, otherwise, we're only focusing on things that are important to us, as you point out. We need to make sure that we're coaching our employees on things that are important and would be and would be validated as such by our customers. So great conversation today about people in the context of the maturity model for technical support organizations. Mike, Greg, Mark, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. We also want to thank you, our listeners, as well, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>